It's the last theology based one, I promise. Hello everybody, welcome back to Meddling in Antiquity. My name is Trey, and today we're going to be talking about the sequel to The Devil's Carnival, Alleluia, The Devil's Carnival. So getting into the people behind and in the movie, the same people as the last time, directed by Darren Lynn Bousman, music by Sar Hendelman, written by Terence Zidinich. Yeah, same, same, same hat, essentially. Um, it's a good portion of the same cast, so you still have Mark Center as the Scorpion, you still have Emily Autumn as Painted Doll, Dayton Callie as the Tiki Keeper. It's, a, it's pretty much the same thing. But, as opposed to The Devil's Carnival, which took place in Hell, Alleluia! The Devil's Carnival takes place in Heaven. So we add characters from Heaven. So giving a little bit, a little bit of a list who, of people that you may know and may not know, uh, first, you have Paul Sorvino, who does in fact return as God. Obviously, it wouldn't be Devil's Carnival unless Paul Sorvino plays God. Uh, and then you have rapper Tech Nine as the librarian. Oddly enough, David Hasselhoff uh, as the designer. Um, Barry Bostwick, who a lot of people will know as uh, Brad from Rocky Horror Picture Show, as the watchword. And then you have Lyndon Smith as Cora and you add Ted, ne uh, Ted Neely as the publicist, as well as Adam Pascal, who just about everybody and their mother knows as Roger from Rent as the agent. So now that we have that out of the way, everyone who's in it, the old people, the new people, all of them, let's get into a little bit about the story. And then after we do the story, I'll get into a little bit of the caste system that heaven is broken down into. So the most interesting thing about Alleluia the Devil's Carnival is it takes place immediately after, almost immediately after the ending of the first film, but most of the story is told in flashbacks. So the biggest difference is that the flashbacks aren't about um, any characters who are going through hell. It's about a character who is already established in hell. Because Alleluia the Devil's Carnival is the backstory of Emily Autumn's character Painted Doll. And how she ended up in hell with the devil at the carnival. And it's very interesting because it, it allows us to see exactly how different heaven and hell are. And I think my favorite thing about it is that heaven as opposed to where hell is a very like late 1800s, early 1900s carnival, like really dark, really grungy, really gritty. Heaven is very much 1920s and you can tell very, that's very much illustrated in the language they use and the slang that's thrown around in the music that they play. Um, but it's very interesting to see how different they ended up. And part of that really plays into exactly what is allowed in heaven. Because we, when we see Painted Doll for the first time as June, which is who she was before she came to the carnival, she was called an applicant, which is what they call people who uh, go to heaven with the purpose of becoming part of that caste system that heaven works on. So we see June as an applicant who, right from the get-go, is very much rebelling against the conformity of heaven. Because the, the biggest thing about heaven is the idea that to be a, an accepted member of the heavenly flock, you must 100% conform to all the ideas of the heavenly flock. And that's something that we automatically see June just pushing back against. Whereas Korra is far more skeptical but Cora has her own secrets implied later in the film by the watchword when she has a confrontation with him, which is that Cora is in love with June. Because the words of the watchword sees her as she's she has this conversation with June in about towards the end of the film. Um, and he says, not only are your feelings for her um, wrong, they are illegal. So obviously, uh, Heaven has its own set of problems. Um, and I think it's very interesting to see how that plays into 
how Korra changes by the end of the film. But the main story does center around June essentially being seduced and played by the agent, specifically so she can be made an example of by God. So I don't want to give too much away about what actually gets her thrown from heaven, but it is her, essentially her ambitiousness and her relentless pursuit of wanting to know why things are the way they are in heaven that resulted in her being ejected from heaven. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how the story plays out. Um, it, it's very much about this relationship of June with the agent, June with Korra, and then Korra with the entire hierarchy of heaven as a whole. So now that I've gotten a bit of the story out of the way, I want to kind of get into the seven-tiered cast system that makes up heaven in the film. The most interesting thing about how the cast system in the film works is that they never really give you a solid idea of who's in charge of each cast system. Uh, there's several characters that do show up that are involved and who watch over certain sections. And my kind of inference of that is that the, the seven people in charge of the seven different tiers represent the archangels. However, we do not see all of them. And if and when hopefully there ever is a third film, I would really like to see all of them and for them to possibly be identified as which archangel they symbolize. So going in, I want to start at tier seven, which is the working horses who are essentially the labor force, the servants, they're the people who are running back and forth, uh, doing everything that all of the other people, all the other caste systems need done, or who just generally, essentially their labor. They are 100% the main labor force in heaven. They are the ones that make sure everything runs smoothly. Uh, we do not meet the head of that particular cast. Um, and so that one is kind of, the head of that particular cast is a mystery as of where the franchise stands now as of 2016. So moving on to tier number six, we have Praying Beasts, which are the enforcers of all the laws in heaven. So they are essentially the hunters. And those would be uh, translators, Bates and Bents who are quite heavily involved in the film and probably have one of my one of my favorite songs in the entire film, which is Good Little Dictation Machines. Um, so they essentially are the, they're the brute force. They, they are the brute squad of heaven. So they are responsible for kind of applying the baton in regards to um, people who are slipping out of the conformity or who are not following the rules. That's their job. We do not meet the head of that cast. And as of now, we have no implication of whether it is Bates or Bents. I am inclined to believe that it is not and that there is someone who is above them who is in charge, but we have not met that person yet. Uh, going on to tier number five, we have the watch, uh, the watchdogs. And the main member of that is the watchword. There is no telling who is kind of the head of um, that particular division, but the watchword in and of himself is kind of the fly on the wall. He's the one who creeps around. He's the one who spreads the word. He's the one who makes, makes sure that the news is out there, but he does it in like the sleazy way. The watchword has a really interesting song called The Hour Belongs to the Watchword, which is kind of very much um, almost like a film noir song. He's like a it's a noir character because he is essentially sneaking around and sniffing out people's secrets, whether they want them to be found out or not. So we have not met the head of that cast yet. There has been no confirmation as to whether the watchword is the head of his own cast, if he is his own character. But when we get up to like the higher casts, um, I'll kind of explain why I do not think that is the case. Um, so moving on to tier number four, we have Birds of Song. And that is essentially the propaganda department. Um, and that is run by the publicist, who I believe is the head of that cast. I'm not particularly sure. Um, 
because again there really has been no clear division of who is in charge of which casts um so we do not know whether the watchword is in charge of uh the watchdogs we do not know whether the publicist is in charge of the birds of song but my idea is that the publicist is the head of that cast because he is the one who puts out all the information he's the one who conducts the birds of song and kind of in my very limited knowledge of how the hierarchy of archangels work because we know there are the seven major archangels that are taught um my idea is that the publicist or whoever runs that fourth cast is probably a reference to Gabriel. Um, and the reason I think that the publicist is probably the head of that cast is because one of the publicist's features is he has a horn that comes out of his ears. So my assumption is that that particular character is supposed to represent the archangel Gabriel and his horn. Uh, since that tier is mostly focusing on music, he is the conductor. He is the one that puts out the word of God. So moving on to tier number three, we have plumes and pelts. And those are the people who ensure that the conformity in heaven is not just in attitude and in spirit, but also in the outfit. And that tier is run by the designer, who is played by David Hasselhoff. And that actually has its own very interesting song called Only by Design. Um, but it's very much the idea that conformity does not just come through the same idea. It comes through the same clothing. It comes through the same decorations. It comes through everything looking uniform. So that is the designer's job. Again, I do not know whether the designer is the head of that particular cast or not because I I believe he is but in regards to which kind of angel which angel I do believe that he represents I have no idea um because like I said my knowledge about archangels and such is extremely limited if there's someone who has a better idea of it feel free to comment and kind of break down which angels you think are the head of each casts um moving on to cast two we have the shepherds of the flock and those are the people who are the overseers. So the heads of each cast would all essentially be in their own cast, which is cast two. So people like the designer, the librarian, the watchword are all members of cast two. Um, though I do believe the kind of the leader of that second cast is quite possibly the librarian because... Um, the the shepherds of the flock the main place we see the librarian the main place that the shepherds of the flock where that in, where that cast is introduced is in the library so my assumption is that the librarian is supposedly a standard of metaton who is the guardian of the word of god and that is the thing that made the most sense to me in regards to this hierarchy and how it breaks down um i think that, that would be that's a very interesting way to do it and he has his own song that happens as june is expelled from heaven called where the he breaks down what each cast does and their purpose in the heavenly hierarchy and that is called um if i can remember the name of it that would be um hitting on all sevens which is another one of my favorite songs this there's not a bad song in any of the any of these films but i think some of my favorite music does come from alleluia and then finally moving on to the final and first cast the top tier that is going to be animal companions and those are the lap dogs those are the people who work and communicate directly to god or the or as they refer to him the creator um and the only one that we see in the film we have no idea if there's any more is the agent who I assume is most likely the Archangel Michael because really that's the thing that makes the most sense to me um and his role is essentially whatever God's commands are he is the one who delivers them or carries them out and that included the um the seduction and subsequent removal of June from heaven um so in this 
the idea of revenge and starting this war against God that the devil plans all starts with the agent, um, which is very, very interesting. And I really, really like the idea of that and how they did it is spectacular. And the agent has a very good song towards the end of the film that is kind of about his, well, not about it, but it's kind of exemplifies what heaven is and that is down in the midnight rectory um which is such an excellent song it's very it's very 20s it's very heavily like a swing kind of jazz song i really do recommend checking out the soundtrack for this one because it is fantastic david hasselhoff is actually a really great singer um which is something i didn't i never thought that i would say out loud to other people but here we are um but that's kind of the breakdown of the hierarchy of heaven as we see it in the film. Um, as now, now that that's kind of out of the way and I've kind of explained the story and the hierarchy of heaven and how it works as we've seen it so far in the franchise, let's get into final thoughts. So the Devil's Carnival franchise has had kind of a really long and... <clears throat> pretty sad history. Unfortunately, um, there has not been any whisper of a film since 2016, because there were issues in how the production company of the film promoted the uh, promoted Alleluia the Devil's Carnival. And as a result, there's not enough really revenue or interest generated for the film. And um, reading through Terence Zdunich's blog, he really lost inspiration for, like, he lost the passion he had for the project in general, which is really sad to see because a lot of people um, have been continuing to look forward to a third film. Um, and it's really sad to know that it was kind of just a lack of care on other people's part that led to their so far not being any conclusion to this absolutely incredible work that he and Darren Lynn Bousman and Sar Hendelman worked so hard to create. Though they are working on American Murder Song, which I have done a video on as well. Um, however, it's, um, I, being in California, I actually attended Sinister CyberCon, where I got to speak to one of the people who worked on the Devil's Carnival film. And, um, he he has he said that there's interest from the crew like people who produced the film um and uh, possibly even Darren Lynn Bousman being interested in finishing the franchise after four years of essentially silence on Devil's Carnival's front um though in the meantime I would recommend definitely check out both the films they are both available on iTunes um, the albums for both films are available on iTunes to stream on Spotify, wherever you buy your music. Um, and if you, if you go, if you can go to performances of American Murder Song, do it because it's a really cool concept and it is supporting two independent creators who are so passionate about the things that they create. And I, I have spent money buying things from the American Murder Song website because I, the creativity behind it is astounding. Um, uh, so far I have purchased a poster that I absolutely love. It hangs over my bed. Uh, two pins, a logo pin for American Murder Song and a Mark of Cain pin for American, American Murder Song. And possibly my favorite purchase that I made is the Donner Party board game that accompanies their Donner Party album. So support if you can. Um, they are doing, they have a bunch of like really cool things running right now on the website. Um, go check it out. Go support Terrence and Sara because they do deserve it. Um, and with that, I end saying that I hope that one day we will get a third Devil's Carnival film. Um, that's, that's certainly the dream. Uh, and with that, that's going to wrap us up for One Off Wonders. And I'll see everybody on Monday for our next episode of Market Music.